Hello everyone, thank you for joining and welcome to today's Energy Harvesting Solutions webinar. My name is Chris Davies and I'm one of the technical directors here at Future Electronics and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session today. Here at Future we collaborate with the world's leading manufacturers allowing us to bring complementary suppliers and leading edge technologies that really work together, ultimately allowing you to design your system solution with confidence and fully supported by the Future Electronics engineering team. During this Energy Harvesting Solutions webinar, you'll get the very latest information insights from three industry experts from Renesas, Panasonic and AVX, enabling you to build a complete system solution for energy harvesting. Everyone who attends will get a complete information and technical resource pack following the event, so you can be sure to have the latest material. I'm very pleased to introduce today's first guest speaker, that's Graham Clark. Graham has worked with low power microcontrollers in a variety of roles for more than 20 years and is now responsible for the introduction of the new SOTV based embedded controllers into the market. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Graham. Over to you. Great, thanks, Chris. So thank you everyone for joining. I hope you can hear me OK and see the material. My name is Graham Clark. I'm the Product Marketing Manager at Renaissance, responsible for our RE microcontroller family. This is a family of devices that we've introduced to target very low power IoT sensor devices. So today, I'm really glad to be here and I'd like to give you a short introduction to what Renaissance are doing. I'll talk a little bit about uh, energy harvesting and the IoT. I'll tell you a bit about our new process development which allows us to make ultra low power devices ideal for energy harvesting applications. I'll tell you a bit about these applications. And also I'll tell you about some of the features of our microcontrollers, particularly the very low power features. I'll talk a bit about how we support energy harvesting and also look a bit about the kind of applications that we can actually support. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about the development tools and then we'll pass over to our colleagues from uh, AVX and Panasonic who will tell us a bit more about some of the other complementary technologies. So I hope this presentation will take about one hour and as Chris said, we'll share the material and uh, everything else around these devices with you afterwards. So again, thank you very much for joining. So first of all, who are Renesas? If you're not aware of Renesas, uh, Renesas are the merging of uh, Mitsubishi, Hitachi, and uh, NEC Semiconductor, uh, along with IDT and Intercell. So today we support many different types of product, analog and power devices, uh, sensors, ASIC, as well as our main business, which is microcontroller. And for microcontroller, we have a huge range of both proprietary and ARM devices, supporting many different applications. And also we have our Synergy platform, which is a range of devices that come not only with uh, the microcontroller, but also with a complete software suite built on top to make it very easy to develop applications, complex applications very quickly. But today I'm here to talk about our RE family and how we, how we can support uh, energy harvesting applications, particularly in IoT devices. So our RE family is something that we've been working on for many years. Uh, as Chris said, I've been working here at uh, Renifath and formerly Hitachi for actually almost 25 years, uh, mainly supporting low power applications. And for Renifath, low power applications has been important for many, many years with our uh, H8 family from Hitachi, with our uh, 78K family from NEC and with the M38s from Mitsubishi. Uh, my controllers, especially low power my controllers, has been a business for a long time. And we support devices for many different applications. But we've seen in the last few years that it's become more and more important, especially with the drive towards a cloud connectivity, with the drive to independent intelligent sensors, to have more performance, more processing power in the individual sensors, but still to take even less power consumption. And this has been something that many of our customers have been asking us for a long time, no matter what the application. So because of this, Renesas had developed a whole new process technology, something we call silicon on thin buried oxide, which is a new way of using silicon to allow us to provide much lower power consumption that's been possible before with the existing bulk silicon processes. 
This process allows us to offer microcontrollers that take less than 20 microamps per megahertz, which enable us to offer a new level of performance in both traditional applications and also perhaps applications that can support energy harvesting as a power source. And we see these requirements to either uh, reduce the size of the battery, to increase the performance, or even to remove the battery in many different applications, ranging from process control and home automation to wearable, wearables to consumer products. The whole range of different applications are demanding these requirements. Hopefully many of your applications are asking the same question. And that's really what we want to start to look about today. So really the question for Renifast and the question that many of our customers are asking is how will we, how will we support the development of the Internet of Things? How will we power all these devices if we're going to have millions or even billions of connected devices in our home, sensing the environment in buildings and factories? How will these things be powered? because uh, there is a significant cost in managing millions or even billions of these sensors. If we're going to use wire to power these devices, if we're going to have billions of smart connected devices connected by miles of copper, that's very expensive, both in terms of the cost of copper today, but also in the terms of installation and managing these devices. Today, people don't really want to have uh, copper wire feeding around your building or putting wire down your road or wire in your factory. Everybody's interested in connected devices without physical connection. So in that case, are we going to have uh, billions of smart devices connected by and powered by battery? And if this is the case, how are we going to how are we going to manage the battery? How are we going to actually uh, uh, replace the battery? How are we going to uh, manage to recharge the battery? And in fact, what we found is many companies actually have guys who go around now in trucks who are visiting their various locations and all they do is change the battery in their sensor. And this is a significant cost. And there's many other costs as well to do with actually using battery. The market is changing. Products are customers are asking all of us to create products that are much smarter, that are faster and they take less resource. And if we have to use battery, this can be a real limiting factor for us. The product form factor can be difficult. If I want to make a, a pair of glasses, for instance, that are smart and contain a battery, uh, really we're limited by the size of the glasses. We can't put a AAA battery in your glasses easily because they won't be very comfortable. So product form factor is an issue. Also for many standard batteries, the lifetime of the battery is a problem. Today you can buy batteries uh, maybe using something like uh, lithium vinyl chloride that maybe can last for 10 or 12 years. But these batteries are quite expensive and actually they use um, quite nasty materials. So it's quite difficult to have uh, to dispose of them sensibly and actually to manage the shipment and to uh, manage the lifetime of the battery. And actually more and more because of things like the European Battery Directive, we're becoming responsible for the lifetime of our product. Maybe many of you are uh, what they call the producer of your product in Europe. This means you have a legal responsibility to manage the lifetime, to manage the disposal of your product. And if it uses battery, to manage the battery and the disposal of the battery itself. The issues are complicated and who's actually responsible under things like the battery directive are not sometimes so clear, but more and more it's becoming our responsibility to manage these. And also another area to think about is product safety. Actually here I say don't kill the pig, but the reason for that is there was a very nice example of just how, why we have to take care that happened in the UK last year. Last year there was a big fire in the north of England and it was reported on the BBC News that a, a farm burnt down. And when they investigated why this farm caught fire, they actually found that in the farm they were using uh, trackers on their pigs. So every pig had a tracker on their leg and one of the pigs ate their tracker. Basically, the tracker fell off and the pig, because pigs eat anything, it ate the tracker. And inside the pig, the tracker started to dissolve, the battery was exposed and sadly the pig exploded. And this set fire to the farm. So uh, not very good for the pig, uh, but actually a little bit funny, maybe not for the pig but actually it just shows that if some small child had swallowed the battery, 
maybe it will be a bigger problem for us all. But some battery technologies are not so friendly, uh, very difficult to um, manage. And it, but it's our responsibility to make sure the product is safe. And there are all sorts of issues now around shipment as well. But also probably the biggest problem with, back with many types of battery is the human factor. Batteries typically only last one, two, three years, unless you buy an expensive technology. So therefore, if we product, want the product to be longer life than this, we have to either charge the battery, recharge the battery, or replace the battery. And we're relying on people to actually do that. And the problem with people is they forget. I know in my house I have a smoke detector in the roof, and very often you will see the battery component, the battery compartment open because either it's uh, making a noise because uh, the battery is discharged, or else uh, I've stopped it by opening it and I've forgotten to replace it. Not great in a smoke detector, but even worse, for instance, if you're making products to look after old people. If an old person is wearing a product, maybe a sensor that detects if they fall, it's very important that that sensor works because you want it always to work if they fall. But if they've forgotten to recharge or replace the battery when it's uh, dying and they fall over, you will not know because they have forgotten. And this is a real problem with this type of product. So in many applications, energy harvesting is perhaps a solution to some of these issues. Maybe for some products, we can harvest the energy in the environment around us to uh, reduce the size of the battery, but maybe even we can use it to remove the battery entirely. And that's something I think that's very interesting to Renesas and some of our partners, but it's also very interesting for many people to understand how they can actually do that. Maybe sometimes it means you have to look at your product in a different way, but for many people, just the act of removing or at least reducing the size of the battery can have some significant benefit. But there are some problems. I mean, uh, if we look at some of the battery technologies, one of the other things that we should think about is the materials that we're using. And just one example that I've chosen here is cobalt. Uh, cobalt is typically used in the batteries of uh, many products uh, because uh, cobalt can be used in the anode of the, and it allows you to create a very efficient battery. So for instance, in my Apple iPhone, uh, this version has about eight kilograms of cobalt inside, which is used in the anode of the battery. And cobalt is a problem. First of all, there's not so much cobalt. Uh, it actually comes from some quite unpleasant places. So today about 50 or 60 percent of the world's cobalt comes from the Congo. It's not such a nice material and also it's used in many types of battery. Today many people are trying to design cobalt out, but it's very difficult to do because there isn't any material you can use for your anode that creates the most efficient battery today, at least not in uh, technology you can mass produce. So because of that, many people are, com are competing to receive uh, as much cobalt as they can. So for instance, a couple of years ago, Volkswagen tried to corner the market in cobalt. They tried to buy all the cobalt because uh, they estimated that by the middle of, this uh, middle of this decade, they would need almost a third of the world's supply just to support their electric cars. And actually, if Tesla build as many batteries as they claim in all their gigafactories, we'd have to increase the amount of cobalt mined by 28%. And that's quite difficult to do, especially when it comes from some quite difficult countries. So as I mentioned earlier, cobalt comes from Congo, it's one of the main suppliers. And actually today, Amnesty International have got a court case with the UN actually concerning child labour. And many companies now are, con are concerned about the providence. They have a social responsibility to manage these issues. So for instance, Apple are under serious pressure to remove cobalt in their batteries. Uh, just because of these issues. So there's a lot of effort going in, uh, but we all have to take some responsibility now for where these materials come from. So there's a lot of issues around battery technology and perhaps energy harvesting is a solution to some of them. But one of the questions is, and maybe something that we talked about later this afternoon, is how much energy can I get and where can I actually use that energy? How can I use that energy? And this is something that Renesas have done a, a lot of work with, with companies like Panasonic. So we've worked with a lot of different technologies, looking at how they can actually uh, support applications and how much energy we can use for them in a typical application. And actually, uh, coming from the UK, the like I do, that's something that we uh, do a lot of work on here. 
because uh, the UK is not the best for some technologies like solar. So in a typical UK summer's day, we're uh, actually not like today. Today the sun is shining a little bit, not quite the summer, but on a typical UK rainy summer's day, indoors we might have quite low light levels, only about 200 lux. But with a typical uh, solar cell, a PV cell inside, 25 centimetre square cell will give us something like 150 microwatt. So at 3 volt, it gives us about 50 microamp to play with. Doesn't sound a lot, but actually if we can harvest that amount of energy and use it and store it perhaps in a super cap, we can do some significant work with that if we're careful. And that's using a kind of general purpose solar cell. If we want to use some optimised photovoltaic technology, perhaps optimised for indoor use, we can actually have a, a smaller solar cell, perhaps two to three centimetres square, again with the same light value, and that will still, still give us about 150 microwatt. So there's a lot of interesting technologies out there. As you'll hear later, we can have solar cells optimised for different uh, performance levels and different lighting sources, and they can give you a reasonable amount of energy we can start to use. There's also other technologies like thermoelectric generators, and today, the latest generation of these, just with a couple of degrees of difference, can give you similar energy levels, 150 microwatt. And you'll see in the next foil why I keep talking about this level, because it's a kind of typical value we use uh, to do calculations on a lot of different applications. There's other uh, technologies as well. Renesas are working with many different companies who are doing different types of energy harvesting. Another one where many people are interested in is vibration harvesters. And these harvesters can generate a huge range of power, almost unlimited, depending on size. Very small ones might only generate a few tens of microwatt, but actually larger harvesters, some of them are the size of a desk, can generate uh, tens of watts of power. So there's a huge range of uh, energy you can actually generate from different types of vibration harvester. And there's many other types of energy source you can look at as well, from uh, plant-based energy sources to uh, small micro turbines. There's a whole range of different energy sources we can use when we're harvesting. But how does this go together with uh, IoT? What can we actually do in a useful application? And actually, Renesas have been working with many companies to look at this area, looking at how we can use different types of technology, different types of harvester, and also create different forms of IoT sensor. And the main, the main power usage in an IoT sensor typically isn't the microcontroller, isn't even the power supply, it tends to be the radio. So what we've done is looked at lots of different applications and uh, developed a lot of proof of concept systems looking at these different applications and how we can use radios differently. And that's where our 150 microwatts come from. We've used something around 45, 50 microamp as a typical um, amount of current that we can have. And then we have to take that current and we have to store it carefully. So using uh, perhaps a supercar from AVX, uh, taking power from a Panasonic uh, solar cell, we can store that and then we can release it when we want to do some useful work, when we have enough energy to power our sensors, to power our radios and to power our complete system. And if we use that small amount of energy carefully, we can do everything. It just takes longer. So, for instance, here you can actually see we've taken some typical sensor application. Here we're using some sensor, in fact, from Renaissance where we have um, a humidity sensor and a temperature sensor as an example. We're taking the energy from a solar cell and we're storing it in a super cap and then we're releasing it to power a variety of different types of radio. So this is a typical IoT sensor application. So here you can see with a Bluetooth radio, we can perhaps have enough power, in this case stored in the super cap, to actually power up the system and to uh, send a message by Bluetooth, perhaps every 15 seconds or so. If we want to use something like a LoRaWAN radio, this takes a bit longer because it wants a lot more energy. So here we're looking about something about every 90 seconds or so. So every 90 seconds, we have enough energy stored to release it, uh, to uh, power the sensors, power the microcontroller when it runs, and power the radio. And finally, if we want a more powerful radio, maybe we'll want to connect to the cloud, something like uh, an MBIOT radio, that takes us a lot longer to get enough power because it takes uh, hundreds of milliamps. But again here, something around seven to eight minutes, every seven to eight minutes we have enough energy that we can actually power that radio and send a message. 
And later on, when I talk about some applications, you can see some typical application that uses this kind of cycle. Many application, many sensors don't need to power up so often. So if you're only measuring temperature or humidity or pressure, many of these the applications change very slowly. So if you're connecting to cloud, you only need to connect either when something important has changed, which is quite slow, or maybe a few times per hour or even a few times per day. So this kind of technology allows you to do that completely without a battery. Renaissance this is a really important application and it's something we believe in the future will become important for many people. We want to either reduce the size of the battery or completely remove it. So a few years ago, Renaissance started research in this area about how we could produce devices that would support this. We needed to create microcontrollers that were lower power, but would enable us to support uh, energy harvesting power sources, which typically only allow us to work with a few microamps of energy, a few microamps of current. And this is where Renaissance developed a new silicon technology. This is something we call silicon on thin buried oxide. This is completely unique to Renaissance. It allows us to make microcontrollers that have a, a unique power consumption and performance portfolio. So this breaks away from the typical restrictions we have with our normal silicon processes today. So today, if we want to make a low power microcontroller, we have to understand the application and what we mean by low power. If we want a device that has very low active power, uh, this means that we can have uh, quite an advanced device. We can use an advanced silicon process technology. Typically, Renaissance use something like 40, uh, um, 40 nanometer process. Uh, this allows us to have very low active power, maybe less than uh, 100 microamps per megahertz, allows us to have high performance devices, allows us to implement a large amount of memory and complex peripherals on the device. But the problem with such an advanced process is that it, the cell size is very small. So because of that, they leak a lot. So when we go to low power mode, the low power modes are not so low. They might be hundreds of microamps or even milliamps in power consumption, even in the low power mode. So this can be a real restriction for us in many applications. And if we want an application which is very low power in the standby modes, then we have to use a larger geometry process. That means that the active mode is not so low power, over 100 microamps or maybe even 200 microamps per megahertz. It means we can't implement so many complex functions. We can't implement large memory sizes. And actually, this, this really gives us a completely different set of application features. And you can see in the diagram on the right hand side, uh, we can almost draw a graph of these processes, both from Renaissance and from our competitor, which means that we have to choose either low standby power or very low active power. We can't really have both with the same process. And that's why we developed silicon on thin buried oxide, because this allows us to have the best of both. It uses silicon in a different way and allows us to have active currents down to 12 microamps per megahertz and allows us to have standby currents down to about 100 nanoamps. So we get very low active power consumption and very low standby current. And this is ideal for any type of battery application, but also these, these power consumptions are so low, they're also ideal for applications that use energy harvesting as well. So using this technology, we've designed devices that are extremely low power consumption and also have extremely low power peripherals as well. That allows us to use this, uh, this process technology to really break the rules. So this is something that's unique to Renaissance. It's uh, patented by Renaissance. We have over 70 patents in this technology. And in fact, today it's uh, used by Renaissance and our fabs. We're actually licensing it to some third party as well. That allows us to break the trade-offs that we've had before. We can produce devices that are very low leakage, very low active current, and also very high frequency, so they can run very fast, but still at low voltage and low current. So this is really ideal for the next generation of IoT sensor. So Renaissance, as we said at the beginning, are a large semiconductor company. We make many different products. Uh, but today, the first devices we're using with this new process is our RE family. And here we have a wide range of devices uh, developed on this process, uh, which allows us to address ultra low power applications. So we have our RE01 family, which is our first generation. These parts are fully available now. 
The first device in the family was introduced at the end of last year and allows us to offer low power devices with up to a megabyte of flash and 256k of RAM. These devices are ideal for wearable applications and very high end sensor applications. We're now introducing our second uh, device in the family, the RE01 256K part. This device is really designed for IoT sensor applications and went to mass production last month. It's a smaller device with 256K of flash and 128K of RAM. And later this year, we'll introduce a device with a Bluetooth radio, which is up to 1.5 megabyte of flash on chip. All these devices use the Cortex M0 Plus core, and at the end of next year, we'll introduce our next generation, which will use the M33 core, which are aimed at higher performance applications. And again, there'll be products with a large amount of memory, perhaps up to two megabyte of memory, and with and without radio on chip. So I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, devices that we have. This is the RE01 1.5 megabyte device. It operates up to 64 megabytes, uh, sorry, 64 megahertz in what we call boost mode. So the highest performance is 64 megahertz, and that's available at all operating voltages. So 1.62 to 3.6 volts. It has three banks of 512K of flash. All of them are independent. So it has up to 1.5 megabyte of flash, and you can program 112, one 512K block when you're erasing a second block. We have up to 256K of RAM, uh, which can be available in some of the standby modes. You can choose how much of the RAM is powered. This device is very low power for such a large device. It has a power consumption of uh, 35 microamp per megahertz. If you use uh, the internal LDO, the internal power supply, if you use it with an external power supply, an external LDO, it runs from about 15 microamp per megahertz. We have a range of standby modes. It can go down to about 140 nanoamp in its standby mode with a basic real time clock and reset function. In our software standby mode, you can have a whole range of different peripherals and uh, other functions powered up. One thing that's unique in these devices, and I'll talk about in a minute, is all the devices come with a unique energy harvesting controller built in to help us interface to energy harvesting power sources such as solar cells. And probably my favorite peripheral in these devices is they come with a unique 14-bit A to D converter. It's a one mega, one mega sample per second 14-bit ADC, but you can run it in a special low power mode where it samples at 1.6 kilosamples a second, running from a 32 kilohertz clock, and the whole chip only takes about four microamps. So again, ideal for uh, low power IoT sensors that have to continuously monitor the environment. So a really nice feature. This is the block diagram of the uh, RE. So this is the, uh, the 1.5 megabyte part. You can see, and I'll talk about it later, these devices have a lot of serial connectivity. This part has multiple UARTs, multiple SPI, multiple I2C, plus QSP and QSPI and USB. And the reason for this is we see many of these devices being in what we call a sensor hub application. So typically you have the microcontroller in the center, basically connected by serial port or by the A to D to a wide range of sensors. So it's really at the center of a spider's web of different functions. And this is true for many applications that we see today. So this device has really been designed for that. We have a large range of serial connectivity function and also a large range of uh, data management functions like DMA controller and data transfer controller to help you manage all the data that's coming in from the sensor without powering up the CPU. It's always good to keep the CPU off as much as possible because it takes a, a lot of the power on the device. These devices also have a lot of timer function on board. Many of them are uh, very low power timers like real time clocks. There's multiple real time clocks on the device, asynchronous timers that don't need a clock. So there's a lot of very low power features. Safety is also very important on these products. So we have a lot of safety features as well. So you can self test a lot of the functions on the chip, like the ADC, like the clocks, like the IO, a lot of safety function built in because we want to make sure that your applications are reliable. Security is another important area. And this is something we have some really advanced security function on these chips. We have both uh, something we call TSIP, which is available in many Renaissance products which is our uh, trusted secure IP. This is a complete security engine that's independent from the CPU. 
and can manage all the security functions on the chip for you. And Renifat provide a library to run that. So it means that your uh, CPU doesn't run any of the security, doesn't run encryption, doesn't manage the keys. It's all done for the engine for you. It's almost like having a secure element on the chip. So this is a really nice feature. And also for security, we have uh, four memory protection units on the device that allows you to support things like secure boot, uh, secure firmware, and also the ability to create key stores on the device. And again, we provide software examples and libraries to help you manage many of the security features. And finally, in these devices, because we're aiming at uh, some quite advanced applications, particularly things like wearables, we have a memory and pixel display and uh, graphics circuit built in to support that. So if you want some very low power uh, graphics interface, these devices can support that. This is the second device in the family, the RE01256K part. It's very similar to the first device. Apart from it's available in smaller packages, we have a range of QFP and QFN packages for this device, and also a very small chip scale package in 2.9 by 3.1 mil square. This device has 256k of flash and 128k of RAM, and it's actually lower power. In with if you use the internal supply, power supply, it's about 250 microamps per megahertz. If you use an external LDO, it can go down to 12 microamps per megahertz. And again, the standby modes are less as well. As you can see, about 350 nanoamp with a full real-time clock running. So it's extremely low power. And on these devices, we have some unique row power peripherals. For instance, we have a wake up timer that takes about 30 nanoamps and you can program it to waking you up hours in, in advance. And also we have the very low power real time clock along with the very low power ADC as well. So these devices are really optimized for low power. So ideal for energy harvesting applications. The functionality of this device is pretty similar to the uh, 1.5 megabyte part. We have a little bit less serial, so we have the same number as UARTs and SPI and I squared C because we really believe, again, this is really in the sensor hub application, in the center of the spider's web of sensors and other devices. The memory size is smaller, 256k of flash, but a very large RAM because we expect a lot of local processing on these devices. So you need some large memory to hold stacks and to hold your data because if you're using a radio or some other communication device, you want to keep communication to the minimum to save power. Most of the other features are exactly the same, the safety features, the security features, uh, the uh, memory and pixel display is there. We have uh, actually more timers on this device, so we have more advanced real-time uh, real clock timers, and also we have more advanced low power timers as well, because we want to do a lot of different timing function for different applications here. So again, this device is really optimized for very low power perform and performance. And this is really shown in our uh, benchmarking. So many of you are probably familiar with the ultra low power benchmark from Embassy, EMBC. And this is an organization set up by the semiconductor companies to provide benchmarking to allow you to, uh, prefer, uh, to compare performance uh, between different microcontrollers. So they have many benchmarks, the most important, most famous is Cormark, but the ERP benchmark is, to, is designed to give an indication of how the performance and power consumption of different devices can vary. And uh, our devices have performed really well in that benchmark. In fact, the RE01256K is the highest performing general purpose microcontroller in the benchmark company. It's about uh, 20 or 30% better than its next nearest competitor. And these benchmarks are really designed to, to show what can be achieved in a typical IoT application. So the benchmark basically takes some complex code, runs it every second, puts the device to sleep, uh, wakens the device up, runs some complex code, a kind of typical cycle that might be uh, typical of many types of IoT sensor to give a feel of what the performance and the energy efficiency is. And the RE really outperforms almost every other general purpose device. What that really means is we get some really nice performance figures uh, for the RE. So for instance, if you're running an active mode from flash at 32 megahertz, this device takes about uh, 0.84 milliamps, so less than uh, one milliamp. And if you run from RAM, you can save a little bit more. It's even more impressive in low power modes. So for instance, if we run at two megahertz in active mode, uh, but in the SRAM, the device takes about 60 microamps, so extremely low power. And we also have a huge range of low power standby and uh, other low power modes 
where we really optimize the device for different applications. So you can see here some of the example. So Liari is really optimized for any sort of uh, very low power application. So both with battery, but also for us, the really interesting ones are energy harvesting applications where we can perhaps remove or at least reduce the size of the battery. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the highlights on this device and the kind of features we've added to support uh, energy harvesting and other low power applications. Probably the most important is a function that we have on this device that we call an energy harvesting controller. This is something we developed specifically to enable energy harvesting applications and allows you very easily to connect uh, devices, uh, harvesters like solar cell to our microcontrollers. And every RE device has one of these on board today. The biggest problem when we're developing energy harvesting applications is actually how we manage that energy. With our normal Mac controller, typical Renifast device actually, when we start the device, the device will power up and start to initialize its registers, it will initialize its clocks, uh, it will start to initialize itself. And typically when it does this, there's an inrush of current that's quite large. And if you've got an energy harvesting source that we discussed earlier, which is only perhaps providing 150 microwatt, so you at three volt, you might only have 50 microamp or so to play with. A traditional microcontroller will immediately demand much more than that for the source and will kill the source. So typically a device might take a milliamp or two milliamps during power up. We've defined the energy harvesting controller on the RE to avoid this issue. We want the device to start with a much lower amount of current. So in fact, we've designed the RE to start by only demanding down to five microamps from your source. So it can start from a very small harvester, providing very little energy. And we want to make sure that starts reliably. And also we can manage that energy because that energy is precious. The energy that's coming from the harvester is really precious and we want to manage that in a careful way. So on all our devices, we've implemented what we call the energy harvesting controller. This is designed to work with a wide range of different harvesting sources, solar cell, thermal generator, vibration harvester, plant harvester, there's many different types. And we can interface all of these to the energy harvesting controller on the RE. And this actually allows you to power up the device from very small amounts of energy. You can use any RE device like a normal mic controller. You can switch off this energy harvesting controller when it powers up as normal. But if you switch it on, what it will do rather than uh, enabling the mic controller is that when you apply power to the device from your harvester, the first thing it does is charge a storage capacitor. And it monitors that storage capacitor. And when there's enough energy in that storage capacitor to actually power the MCU, then the MCU will be started. So we actually allow you to do that autonomously. So the energy harvesting controller will monitor that for you and manage that initial power. Once the device is running, you can start to decide what to do. Your, your software can run power by that initial energy and you can then decide what to do with the power coming from your power source. So for instance, you can use it to charge a secondary battery or a super cap. And uh, you can also use it to power your sensors. We can actually supply power to external devices. You can use it to power your radio. So in fact, the RE can provide up to 30 milliamps, perhaps from a super cap or secondary battery to external devices. So this circuitry is designed to take that small amount of energy that we have from the harvester, to look after it and to actually manage it carefully. So we do some of this in hardware. We start up the device in hardware, but you can control in software once the device has enough energy to run, what we actually do with that power. So it's a really nice way to easily manage the power coming from a variety of power sources. And you can manage that power, you can store it, and you can decide what you want to do with it. Because that's really what's important in energy harvesting is looking after that energy that you have and using it carefully in the best way and making sure the system runs reliably. And that's what this part of the device is designed to do. I can actually talk about this a long time because there's a lot of nice features in the harvesting controller. And if anybody is interested, there is a lot of information on our website and application notes with detailed descriptions of how this works. But that all goes together with the low power features on these devices. The RE is designed really to be extremely low power consumption, but also we've designed it to be very optimized so we can optimize the power inside the device depending on what you're trying to do. So we've divided the chip 
inside into a number of different power domains. And these domains can be switched on or switched off depending on how much power is available and what you want to do. You have complete control in your software as to how you power the chip. So inside every device, there's four power domains and each one of these domains can be switched on or switched off depending on what you're doing, how much power is available and how you actually want to use it. And our RE also has uh, all the usual uh, features of a normal mic controller. You have run mode, you have sleep mode, you have standby modes. And again, you can control these as you like, just like in a normal mic controller. But in the RE, they're more optimized because we not only control the power consumption of the device to the individual domains, we also control the power consumption of the device depending on how fast you're running. So our internal LDO is actually multi-step. So we can actually optimize the number of LDOs that we're using on the device, depending on how fast you want to run the chip. If you want to run the chip at 64 megahertz, we switch on all the power supplies. If we want to run the chip at two megahertz, we optimize the power supply and switch off the extra power supply cap capability that we don't need. And this is true in all the modes. So this means that, for instance, at 32 megahertz, we might take 25 microamp per megahertz, but at 2 megahertz, we take something like 21 microamp per megahertz. So we can really optimize the power consumption for exactly how you want to run the application at any time. It's like having a power supply gear stick. You can actually change gear and optimize the power consumption you want for any time in your application. And again, in your software, you have complete control of that. On the RE, we have one extra feature that maybe some of you are not familiar, so familiar with, and it's something that's available on a number of other Renaissance microcontrollers, and it's something we call snooze mode. And that's an extra mode that's really designed to allow some of our peripherals to run more intelligently, because we always want to minimize the amount of power that we take, and the CPU is one of the worst consumers of power, especially when it's running the data bus, the bus. So snooze mode allows us to run peripherals without running the bus, so without wakening up the CPU. So in snooze mode, the CPU is effectively doing exactly that. It's snoozing. It's in a very low power standby mode, but some of the peripherals like the ADC and the serial ports can run autonomously even in that mode. And how we actually use, for instance, the ADC, here we have an ADC example. We can run the chip in a very low power mode, just taking perhaps in software standby a few hundred nanoamps. And we can run the asynchronous timer at 32 kilohertz. This timer only takes a few tens of nanoamps, but we can program it to waken up the ADC. So perhaps every second, we waken up the ATD converter and we ask it to make a conversion. All the time the CPU is sleeping, so it doesn't waken up. So we're only taking a few hundreds of, micro of uh, nanoamps. When the ADC runs, it takes a sample, and then inside there's actually some comparator. So it looks at that sample and you can program the comparator to tell you when the value is outside the window or is inside the window. So in this case, we're looking at when the value is inside the window. So we take a measurement, the value is outside the window, so we don't waken up the CPU. This happens a couple more times. And then finally, we take a reading and uh, the value now is inside the window. So now we're waking up the CPU and the CPU will waken up. It will run and then do some processing. But this is a really nice way, again, in an IoT application to keep the CPU off, to minimize the power consumption while you're still running. And actually, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the ADC can run at 32 kilohertz at uh, 4 microamp. In fact, on a real chip, if you do this and waken up the device maybe uh, one time, uh, maybe a few times per second, then the average power consumption is around 2 microamps. So we can half it using this technique. So we get some really low power uh, monitoring of a device. So it's a really nice feature. We also have many other nice features on these devices. One I wanted to mention, and it's an issue in a lot of applications, is uh, uh, some people stay asleep for really a long time. Uh, they want to waken up maybe in a week or maybe even two weeks or three weeks. Who knows? There are many different options depending on what your radio is doing, what your application is doing. So on these devices, we've designed some timer that allows us to waken up with very long time periods or very short time periods. So we have a number of different timers you can do this with. So for instance, the asynchronous timer can run from the 32 kilohertz clock. This 32 kilohertz clock is also compensated. We can make it accurate to about uh, two parts per million. So it has some compensation circuit built in. 
And uh, the AGT can give you, if we use it with a very small resolution of 30 microseconds, you can waken up any time up to 36 hours in, uh, in the future. If we use a longer four millisecond resolution, then you can actually program it to waken you up any time in the next 194 days because it's a 32 bit timer. So it means you can run very low power. So you can see here with an average power consumption of perhaps less than 500 nanoamps, uh, but with a very accurate wake up a long time in the future. And for some applications that could be really important. Something else that's really interesting in these devices they've really designed them to think about how people are using their application. So for many applications, we have different types of power supply on the device. You might have a radio that's powered at 3.3 volts. You might have a sensor that's powered at 2.4 volts. There might be a number of different uh, voltages working on your board. And actually, the most one of the most important things and one of the things we uh, many people do in energy harvesting applications is they want to completely turn off these devices when they're not being used. And actually with the RE, we can supply the power to these devices and actually we can turn them off when we're not using them. So if you have a radio that only has to power up once every 15 minutes, as many applications do, then the rest of the time, let's actually depower the radio so it doesn't take any power at all. And the RE is designed to support that. We on the 256K part, we have uh, four independent power domains on the chip. On the 1.5 megabyte part, which is larger, we have up to seven. And each one of these domains can be powered individually at a different voltage. The voltages themselves are generated externally. We don't generate the different internal, the different external voltages. You need some supply to do that, but we can power the IO themselves at different voltages with the external supply. And also you can completely depower each of, one, each of these IO blocks. And the reason for that is if you're depowering external devices and now your IO is connected to uh, uh, effectively a floating pin, you might get some strange effect. So actually with the RE microcontroller, we designed the chip to actually work in that condition and you can logically turn off the IO as well. So not only can you depower these IO domains, you can actually logically turn them off as well. So we have the ability inside the chip to turn off the logic to each one so you don't get any strange stray signals or any strange effect inside the chip. So no undefined signals. And I think this is really unusual in a microcontroller, but in an energy harvesting application, you really want to keep everything depowered as much as possible because you're managing that power. So this ability to disconnect the IO and make sure there's no stray signals inside is really powerful. It really simplifies your uh, design and makes your device much more reliable. And talking about reliability, I mentioned earlier we have uh, almost a secure element inside the chip, something we call TSIP, Trusty Secure IP. This is really designed to manage all your security requirements. So Renesas provide a library for this. TSIP is completely independent. It's like having a security co-processor. It has its uh, it has ability to have a unique ID inside. Every chip is uniquely identifiable. It has a random number generator. It has an AES encryption accelerator. Uh, all of that functionality is inside the device and it manages all your security functions for you. So it's completely independent. Even if somebody tries to uh, access your CPU, they can't get into the security function. It's like having a secure element, but built into the chip. So you don't have that weakness of a serial connection or something. Everything is inside the device. And this is a really nice feature. There are many other nice features on the devices for low power applications, but we don't really have enough time to talk about them today. Uh, but really what I wanted to highlight again was this sensor hub concept. What we see in a lot of different applications is the microcontroller at the center of a web of different features. So a web of sensors connected by serial port or connected by the A to D converter, uh, connected to a radio, whether it be BLE or LoRa or uh, wireless MBUS or MBIoT, and everything powered by maybe a battery, but more likely, uh, hopefully, some sort of uh, energy harvester, whether it be thermoelectric or hydro or solar, and storing the power in some sort of rechargeable or uh, um, uh, super cap. So something that allows us to manage that energy and use it when we want. But really, the microcontroller is the center of this web. Interesting. 
Sorry about that, we have technology problem. And really this is what a typical application looks like. So we might have uh, something like a Panacell, Panasonic solar cell. So actually we use a lot of the uh, devices like the AM1816, which you'll see later on. Uh, this supplies power to our device and we take that power and we use it carefully. We store it in our super cap uh, and we use that to power all the other devices in our application. So we use it to power the sensors when we need them. We use it to power the wireless when we need that. And each one of these is controlled individually. We supply the power to them when it's needed and we control that power. So we're taking the energy that's stored in the super cap and we're using it as uh, carefully as we can. And that's really the key to energy harvesting. Sometimes it means we have to look at our application slightly differently, but we really have to manage that power, manage that energy that's available. And I want to show you now a couple of typical applications uh, where we're seeing this kind of thing used. And one of them is in, uh, this is a very typical IoT sensor application, but it's quite sexy, I think, because it has some quite unique components. And uh, the picture you can see here is of something we call a power spike. It's, it's not something to kill vampires with, it's actually an energy harvesting source. So this is a spike that we can drive into the ground and we can actually generate energy just by the temperature difference, 50 centimetres underneath the ground and the surface. And this temperature difference can be two, three, four degrees sometimes, but it's enough for us to generate enough energy to power the microcontroller, to power the radio, to power the sensors, and to create a, keep sy a complete system that shares, that shares data. And this, is, this particular example is actually used for a, a smart farming demonstrator. And this is something actually that Renesas have, and it's actually on in test at the moment in various locations around the world. This system actually uses some Renesas component to measure uh, temperature and soil humidity. Uh, we measure that roughly uh, every 90 seconds, and then we take a LoRa radio and we share that by LoRa. And this uses uh, the thermoelectric generator to, to generate the power, or else actually because uh, you can never be sure that there will be enough temperature difference in the soil. So um, that's interesting. We also use a Panasonic solar cell. In fact, you can see it here in one of our prototypes as a backup. So this system is actually in test at the moment. We have some systems here in Europe. And actually in the next slide, hopefully you can see a video of this system. And here you can actually see the sensor unit with the LoRa radio. You can see our power spike actually driven into some artificial soil. The LoRa radio is sending data to a receiver. And then you can actually see here the temperature and humidity displayed in a tablet, showing you how the application actually works. That's one typical application. Uh, here we have another typical application that we see. This is actually a, an air quality monitor. This system actually is uh, um, very simple. It basically uses again the same Panasonic solar cell, but now we're storing energy again in a super cap to use a near quality sensor and actually to measure the quality of the air in the environment around us, as well as the temperature and pressure, and drive it onto a small MIPS display. So the solution is actually very similar. Again, we have this sensor hub concept. We have the energy this time from a solar cell. We do actually have a battery as a backup because in this application, perhaps you will, you will carry this around and put it into your uh, suitcase over the weekend. And maybe we don't have enough energy to keep going. So we have a, a coin cell as well as a battery backup. But the system, actually, I have these in my house and they've been working for a couple of months with actually no battery in them. So they take very small amounts of energy and they can give us some quite useful work out of that. So again, here you can see a video, and here uh, we have the air quality demo. Again, this will work quite happily even in the UK on a not so sunny day. You can see we have the RE microcontroller on a small board. Here we're using the chip scale package. This particular version is 1.5 meg, which is uh, uh, four millimeter square. Here you can see the MIPS display with the air quality and the temperature and the humidity. They have the AVX uh, super cap at the bottom. So quite a nice solution, very compact, but extremely low power. There you can see the gas sensor. Oh, An AVX super cap at the bottom. All the energy for the application is coming from the solar cell and is being stored there. And it's enough most of the time to run overnight. So the boards I have at home quite happily run overnight sitting on my windowsill.
If anybody's more interested in these applications and other applications as well, you can find more about these on our website and also the uh, schematics and all the design information uh, for these is available from uh, future if you're interested. So I just finally want to talk a little bit about what's available for these devices. So like any other microcontroller, we have an evaluation board and the evaluation board provides all the normal features you would have uh, with a microcontroller evaluation board. So every evaluation board comes with the uh, RE microcontroller on the board. It also comes with a uh, JLink on board on chip debugger, so you don't need any uh, debugger. You can connect it directly to your PC. We also have uh, all the uh, circuitry of the microcontroller available on the board. We also have some uh, expansion ports. You have an expansion port for the uh, Arduino connector. So we have an Arduino Uno connector on these and you can easily connect uh, an Arduino shield. So for instance, we often use a um, LoRa Arduino shield with these boards. We also have a couple of PMIP, uh, PMOD expansion connectors, so we can actually use them. For instance, we supply a MIPS display as an example with this board, and you can use it to drive a MIPS display. So we also have a small super cap on the board and also a secondary battery interface as well, if you want to connect a larger super cap or perhaps a rechargeable battery. The very unusual thing on this board is it also comes with an energy harvesting interface. So this allows us to connect energy harvesting power sources as well. And there's a switch that allows you to run the device in energy harvesting mode. So actually as standard, we supply this device with a Panasonic uh, solar cell. So you can actually play with energy harvesting yourself straight out of the box. But also it's possible to use a wide variety of other solar cells, as well as many other types of energy harvesting source as well. So it's quite a unique feature. This board is great if you want to use normal uh, development techniques, but also if you want to play with energy harvesting, you want to understand how energy harvesting can work, this board is really useful as well because it comes with everything you need to use with an energy harvesting power source and also comes with the Panasonic harvester. For Renaissance, we've always had a long history with IR, so these devices are supported by IR, both uh, for their debuggers, but also for the EWARM toolchain. And also Renaissance have our own um, uh, Eclipse environment. So this works with GCC and it's an environment called eSquare Studio, which also supports these devices. So a complete range of development tools is available and they're in stock at future. And also on our website, you can find a lot of information and application notes and sample code for these devices. So finally, uh, hopefully this has given you an idea of what the uh, RE is capable of and how perhaps we can support energy harvesting applications. Renaissance are working with a wide range of partners, as you've seen, like uh, AVX and Panasonic, to help us enable uh, a new generation of ultra low power applications, especially those that can use energy harvesting power sources, perhaps to remove or reduce the need for batteries. And this is something I think in the future that's going to become more and more important. The ability of the RE to uh, reduce the power consumption of your products with our new SOTB process means that many more types of application become possible. So the RE has many unique capabilities, uh, just some of which we've managed to touch about today, that with the very low active power consumption, the very low standby current, and also the ability to run at high, high speeds down to 64 megahertz of low voltage will enable us to create a whole range of different types of application. So we think really that these devices are ideal for many low power applications, but really for the first time, IoT sensor applications that work without battery are really within reach. The performance of these devices, the performance of some of the other components that are available now, make these applications more than possible. So I think, I hope this has given you just a short idea of what's possible. Uh, there's a lot more on our website. There's many other videos you can see. We have a dedicated website for these devices at www.renaissance.com.re. And there you can find the data sheets, application notes, the software downloads. You can find a lot of sample applications. So there's a lot of more information there that you can find to use. And if you do have any questions, again, please feel free to uh, contact us afterwards or to post them on the call and we'll get back to you to answer them. So I hope this has given you uh, an idea of what the RE family is capable of and why we think uh, energy harvesting for the future is a really important technology. And hopefully in the next couple of presentations, you'll understand more about some of the other complementary technologies that are available. 
So I'd like to hand you back to Chris now, who will introduce the next speaker. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you found it useful and I hope we'll speak to a lot of you again. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Absolutely fascinating insights into uh, energy harvesting, uh, IoT, uh, the complete Renesas RE product family that's underpinned, uh, as you shared, by the latest SOTV uh, process technology. So thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Sandra Lutzenberger. Uh, Sandra is an expert application engineer at Panasonic uh, for the Amaton Solar Cells. With fantastic technical experience and insights to share uh, into harvesting energy for IoT, uh, wearables uh, and many more applications. So Sandra, over to you. So thank you very much and welcome everybody also from currently rainy Munich. Um, so I will give you a short insight now on our Morton um, solar cells. I think already Graham I uh, gave you a lot of insights how to use it uh, in different applications and also to explain why it is important to um, not use cables, why it is important um, to have solutions uh, in the field of energy harvesting. When I'm talking about uh, Amorton, this is a Panasonic specific name, so basically this consists of amorphous and photon and is our name for our amorphous silicon solar cells. So basically, when we're talking about solar cells, we do have a high variety of different technologies on the market. Um, one part that we have are solar cells made of the material silicon. So and they're basically based on the different manufacturing process that we have. Um, we do have um, different properties. So in our case, we're talking about the amorphous silicon solar cells, which have kind of a quite random atom structure. In comparison, quite well known are monocrystalline and polycrystalline solar cells. And as I already said, they're manufactured in a completely different way. So therefore, the mechanical, the physical, the optical properties are completely different. So our specific manufacturing process allows us to create solar cells which are very thin and lightweight and scalable solar cells. So as Graham already mentioned, the field of wearables, smart watches um, plays quite a big role. So this had been also in the past one of our big markets um, where solar cells of this kind had been commonly used. With the manufacturing process, we can also produce variable shapes. So that means if it's round, if it's square, triangular, we basically don't care. The solar cells can be produced directly on different kind of substrates. So in our case, we're talking about glass, we're talking about stainless steel, or we're talking about glass substrates. So, so here we have a high freedom and design of our um, end application. And as I said, also the optical um, properties are different. So the wavelengths or the light that a solar cell can absorb and transform into energy differs between the different technologies. So in our case, when we're talking about a Morton, here they're for perfect use indoors. Then we have also a second category um, of these very thin and lightweight solar cells. Um, and here the big advantage is that we do not use any scars or toxic materials. So I would say in the field of thin film solar cells, uh, we are the quite uh, a well established um, and long existing um, technology. We have been talking about the field of IoT. There shall be a lot of uh, sensors, sensors shall be smart. Um, you don't want to put cables, you don't want to put a battery. So um, with the whole field of IoT, also the demand for these solar cells increases. I want to pick up the question from Graham's presentation um, about how much can I, energy can I get from these um, energy harvesters? So just to give you a rough feeling before we have always been talking about those 200 looks, um, we specify our solar cells commonly at those 200 lux of fluorescent light. And at such an illumination, you can get roughly five to six microwatts of energy per square centimeter. But 200 lux, what does that mean? So basically you can say indoors, 
when you have a working place, like in my case here, where you want to read, where you want to write, you want to see properly because you, you're working on something, then usually we can say we are in the range of 500 looks to 1000 looks. Let's say you want to have the cozy um, ambience of uh, a living room, then we are rather in the range of 200 looks. When you say, okay, I'm just having um, a dark corridor with kind of an emergency illumination, then you're rather in the range of maybe 50 looks. So just to give you a feeling of how much energy we're talking here or how much illumination we're talking here. And already at these 200 looks um, of illumination that we have in a living room, um, you have already seen we can power um, an IoT Edge device with Bluetooth Low Energy, LoRaWAN, um, and BIoT. Now, when we're looking outdoors, um, we have the sunlight, we have a high variety of different conditions. So depending on which season do we have, um, where are we located? Is it Central Europe? Is it um, very up in the north? Is it, um, is it somewhere in Africa? So here, depending on the season, on the location, what's the weather, we have a quite huge range of different illumination levels. So as you can see here, we vary between uh, 5,000 looks up to 90,000, 100,000 looks. There is this indication given of uh, AM 1.5. This AM 1.5 is a standard um, defined to compare solar cells under outdoor conditions. So this AM 1.5 is roughly 110,000 looks. So this would be clear sky, ideal conditions. So at this um, value, you would get roughly six milliwatt per square centimeter of energy. Graham had already shown um, some examples where um, the AM1816 was used. So this is a solar cell from our indoor portfolio. So in this case, we're having roughly a size of 50 square centimeter of active area, which results in the end at 300 um, 38 microwatt at these 200 looks. And basically, if you say, okay, I will have um, 400 looks of illumination, so the illumination is doubled, you would have double power. And the same the other way around. But why am I talking about this topic of uh, different light sources, illumination, indoors, outdoors? Because we do have different light sources. Outdoors, we have sunlight. Natural sunlight consists um, in its spectrum of the UV part, visual wavelengths and infrared wavelengths. So UV part basically means this is what turns your skin red. The infrared part which makes a warm feeling. So of course when you are designing an artificial light source for indoors, you don't want to get a sunburn and you don't want to get um, any any heat, so you don't want to waste any energy in producing heat. So that means for um, artificial light sources, it consists only of the visual wavelengths. Why is this important? Because now it's the question, what can our solar cell absorb and of what kind of wavelengths and of what kind of light can we generate energy? So what you can see here is basically the absorption spectrum of our amorphous silicon solar cells. So the peak of absorption is exactly in the field of the visual wavelengths. So that means all of this light from our light source can be absorbed and transformed into energy. Which also means that parts of the infrared light and from the ultraviolet light, we're not so strong. So this is not what the amorphous silicon solar cells can absorb. So we cannot use this part. As I said, outdoors and sunlight, okay, we also have the visual wavelengths, but okay, with the amorphous silicon solar cells, we cannot use the UV part and the infrared part. So how does it look like for other solar cell technologies when we look at monocrystalline, for example, the peak is rather in the infrared part. So that means monocrystalline solar cells are really strong in transforming infrared light into energy, which is nice for outdoors, but indoors, is no um, infrared energy, so therefore, indoors, I would say, the amorphous silicon solar cells are much stronger. 
So basically in our portfolio, we um, differentiate between our indoor series, which is optimized for um, harvesting energy from really low illumination from artificial light sources. And we do have our outdoor series. So that means here we basically have solar cells um, which are optimized to harvest energy from stronger light sources where you have a bit of a higher current which is running. So here we are differentiating between those two different types, but basically you can use both and both environments, even if always one is stronger in its field. So basically in our portfolio at Panasonic, you can find a quite broad um, variety of solar cells of different materials. So if it is a film type, a glass type, if it is for indoor series or outdoor series, if it's round or rectangular. In case that you say, okay, I don't find in the standard portfolio what I need. So you can always consult us for customized types. So what basically can we do? When we're looking at these customized solar cells, we can change the substrate material, as I already said. So we can say we produce it on glass, we produce it on film. So in case of film, we have this very lightweight and flexible material um, with a very thin thickness. We can change the terminal structures. So we can have uh, different um, contacts in the end. So if it is with wires, if it is solderable, if it was, is it with, with an uh, conductive paste um, for heat sealing um, or to connect with a spring. And also we are flexible on the voltage. So since we have this very different manufacturing process, basically, basically we can produce solar cells from a very low up to high voltages, which is possible. So basically when you see, okay, you're using um, the microcontroller from Renesis, and you see, okay, this and that would be the perfect um, voltage range from a solar cell, we can produce um, such a specific solar cell. So here we're quite flexible. One thing that I would like to mention also is the question um, that I get quite often. So why should I use a high quality Panasonic solar cell instead of a quite cheap Chinese um, solar cell? So where's, where is the difference or what makes the difference? Basically, if you say, okay, I'm purchasing a solar cell with a specific specification, um, in case of Panasonic, you will get exactly this specification. On the left hand side, you can see 100 samples um, of one type from a Chinese manufacturer, where I can see, for example, if we say we are operating our um, device at a voltage of 2 volt, you can see that at these 2 volt, you will get a high variety of different currents. So it might be that you make your calculation based on the data sheet and you say, okay, should be, should be fine, so the current is enough. Then you might have also devices where you're getting trouble because maybe you don't meet the minimum current requirements or something like this. So in this case, it's really important that the systems fit very well together to avoid that um, the whole efficiency will drop. So to make the summary out of it again. So in case of a Morton, we have such an absorption spectrum that it fits perfectly for indoor conditions and for weak light. So especially in the rather northern countries, it might happen quite often what we have here right now, so that it's raining, um, that you have very weak light conditions. So in this case, this solar cell technology um, is the right choice. And as you have already seen from the examples also from Graham, these solar cells deliver sufficient energy to supply low power IoT applications. And then as I said, so even from low up to high voltage levels, we can produce a lot of different um, levels of energy or of, of voltage. We can produce thin and lightweight solar cells, which are perfectly um, for the use with the variables. And as I said, also those thin and lightweight and flexible solar cells give you a very high freedom of design. Um, when you create your application. 
that's it, the short inside of, um, on the uh, Morton Solar Cells from my side, and I hand over back to Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, really tremendous insights into showing what's possible uh, by harvesting energy from uh, different light sources. Uh, particularly interesting to hear about the customization options uh, also uh, that you can offer. Um, our next speaker is uh, Radek Senka. Uh, Radek is Product Marketing Manager for AVX Supercapacitors. Uh, he brings uh, years of experience in guiding customers into in how to select the right SuperCap technology uh, and implementing that selection uh, in their system solution. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to hand over to Radek. Radek, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. So in the next 15 minutes, I will try to give you uh, some kind of insight into the AVX portfolio of supercapacitors. Uh, just briefly about the company, uh, we are one of the uh, manufacturers of the passive components, uh, mainly capacitors. We've been here for a while uh, in the industry and regarding the family of the supercaps, we have started to uh, make some effort there since uh, year 1997, which is probably not so known um, so we have a bit of history behind uh, the R&D and uh, also the know-how which we gained uh, over the decades. Uh, so that's what we bring to our products. Uh, currently we have uh, three facilities where we are able to manufacture uh, our super caps. One will be the Greenville in the USA, our headquarters. Uh, then we have a facility in Juarez, Mexico, and uh, the recent acquisition was uh, made in China in a city of Chengdu, where we have currently our high volume production. Uh, briefly about uh, the difference between the <clears throat> supercapacitor and the battery. Uh, well, there are, there are things why the first choice, your, your first choice of the uh, power storing device would be the battery. Mostly it's the parameters and then it will be the cost. But you can get to the situation when uh, the parameters are just not enough. It may be a temperature range, it may be the lifetime. And uh, if you get into that situation, if the standard batteries don't offer the performance or the lifetime you expect, then it's time to consider the supercap solution to be uh, to be used. It can be in, used in conjunction to the battery, or in some cases you can even replace the battery totally. Uh, here are a couple of facts about the differences between the supercap uh, and the batteries. Here I'm, I'm talking about the lithium ion, but uh, it will apply to basically any chemistry, any battery chemistry. Uh, in general, we can say that uh, the charging time of the supercap will be always much faster than if you charge the battery. We all know how, we, how long it takes to charge our cell phones. Uh, then we also know that the cy uh, cycle life, uh, or let's say a lifetime, of the battery which we have in our cell phones is not so dramatic. Uh, so 500 uh, cycles of charging and discharging, and then you have to buy a new phone, right? Because of the battery. Uh, in the in the supercapacitor, you can expect half a million up to one million, and then then even higher number of cycles, depending on the conditions and depending on the exact product. Uh, so obviously, it's uh, much higher. Uh, however, there are also some kind of a downsides of the supercap. In general, we cannot store as much energy uh, in a super cap as we can do in a battery if we take the same size of both solutions. Uh, however, the specific power, meaning the uh, the peak current you can get from from the device, is much better if you if you take the super cap. Batteries are in general not very good uh, for delivering the high current peaks. Yes, they are, they are 
OK to deliver stable voltage. That's what they are made for and designed for. But if you need some kind of a, if you need to service uh, some kind of a higher current peaks, then you might think about the, the super cap. The cost of the device is a bit higher depending on depending on situation, but it will always be higher than the battery. However, please also consider what uh, Graham said at the beginning. Uh, usually the maintenance cost of the of the, uh, of the sensor is not really taken into account. If you do that, you will find out that you will actually save money for uh, selecting the good uh, PCB design and uh, a good setup of the components, so including the super cap. What it will give you to use the super cap in combination with the battery or or only uh, solely, uh, it will give you the lifetime. So as I mentioned, if you need the lifetime, if that's what you're looking for, or if you are looking for a higher reliability, perhaps your battery is not able to deliver as much uh, high currents uh, or current peaks as you as the application demands. Well, then the answer is super cap. The temperature range will always also be uh, better than the battery, so you can rely on these devices to work even under the quite harsh conditions. It's important to understand what we are looking for when we are selecting uh, the super cap, so we always need to understand the temperature range, the application type, so there are three basic types, and for energy harvesting we usually are looking for the low leakage current. That's usual. Uh, however, sometimes it can be combined with the uh, uh, low ESR demand. As I mentioned before, if you need to deliver uh, higher currents, uh, so for some kind of a communication uh, protocols or whatever uh, it may be. Then the operating voltage, that's very important. I will get to the balancing uh, later on. Then the expected uh, lifetime, so how long your device is ex expected to be to, to survive in the field. And then the cost of expectation. In AVX, we have, uh, I would say, an advantage over uh, the others that uh, in our supercapacitor family, we have various products. OK, so. We started with the best cap. As a brand name uh, in 1997, uh, this product is still available. Uh, it uh, it's it's fine for the applications where you are looking for a very uh, thin uh, device. So, if you want to fit it in, into your housing and it's uh, it's very flat, uh, best cap would probably or could be your uh, solution. Then our recent uh, or the most recent uh, release was the cylindrical series uh, where we are producing the cells, the cylindrical cells and the cylindrical modules as a, as a result of conjunction of those. Uh, and then the Prisma cap, which is not yet released, but we are looking forward to that uh, in the next year. So each of these devices use a different uh, electrolyte and that dictates the different parameters in terms of the voltage per cell, in terms of the uh, cap value range, uh, that the temperature performance and the ESR and leakage performance. Also, it will be connected to the cost of the device. So currently our high runner is the cylindrical series, either it's a uh, single cells or modules. Let's get into a little bit of detail. So the best cap, as I mentioned, might be uh, very interesting for customers looking for very uh, thin devices. So usually portable devices. We have uh, noticed that Renesas is uh, using one of these solutions, uh, well, in terms of electrical parameters uh, in their device. So possible, there, there might be possible usage for one of our components. Uh, because if if the application calls for small, let's say uh, let's say a small uh, capacitance value, so 47 millifarads is not so small if we consider the ceramic caps. But 
if we consider supercapacitors, it's kind of small. Uh, so this fits into the range where we are with the best cap. We can do up to one farad devices there. And uh, it's also very compact, as I, as I mentioned. So these might be one of the answers. Cylindrical cells. Uh, we have a portfolio of uh, standard uh, 2.7 voltage devices, then the extended 3 volt range. And uh, also we are able to supply what we call a low ESR series, so LE series. And that is basically even lower uh, ESR performance than the, the standard series, which is already quite low. Uh, However, we are we still have a running R&D, so we are actually focusing on reducing the ESR even even lower because uh, that's one of the parameters which is uh, important for most of our customers. Current range is up to 3000 farads, but that that uh, stands for the cells. And uh, with these cells, so cells from either voltage range or uh, either design, we can stack them together and build uh, the modules. Uh, our standard offering is basically up to 9 volts. Um, in the Renaissance products, you may find uh, one or some of our references. So in the air quality monitor, uh, they are using a one for a device. In the soil moisture uh, detector, they are using a half of farad or uh, 470 uh, millifarad device. So these are the catalog range, but I would like to stress that if uh, there is something which requires more cap value or more uh, or higher voltage, <clears throat> please don't be uh, don't be afraid to ask. We are always open to customize, and because uh, we already do that, so that's no problem there. What we also have is a range of the high rail and also let's say commercial grade of the plastic encapsulated devices. So this looks like this. It's a bit different than the, the standard book product. Mm, the insights are the same, so it's only about the encapsulation and that provides a really uh, impressive performance in the high humidity environments. So this is what it was made for and uh, it's used by customers who are seeking for higher reliability. Well, to balance or not to balance, I said I will touch this topic. Sounds like a kind of a Shakespeare. Uh, we we basically had to solve this question when we were dealing with uh, uh, the SCM series. So meaning the combination of two or more cells uh, creating a, creating a module. Normally you would have to balance the whole pack to uh, make sure that uh, you will spread the, the voltage equally on each cell. The reason for that is that you want to make sure that uh, they will, these cells will age in the same rate. If they will not, you have a problem because uh, one of them will age faster and it will take uh, the other, other cells with it and your whole module will degrade faster because you didn't do the balancing properly. What we found in AVX was that uh, we can actually kind of avoid the balancing, the standard balancing. Uh, the standard, I mean, we use uh, the passive resistors, and uh, that's what uh, you can actually see. Uh, basically, uh, that's what you can see that the Renaissance is using the unbalanced versions. So don't be afraid of that. Uh, we have that in our catalog as uh, the unbalanced, uh, described as unbalanced module, but it's uh, the way we do the balancing internally is the electrical matching. Uh, and these are examples of the performance of such devices, of these unbalanced devices. Uh, here you can see the cap value uh, at the different voltages, 4 volt, 4.5 and 5 volt, uh, and the ESR performance at these voltages as well. We guarantee 1000 hours of a performance uh, before the device goes end of life. End of life is 
defined as 70% uh, of the initial cap value and 200% uh, of the initial uh, ESR. And we found out that by simply matching the components electrically, uh, we achieve the effect of balancing. So we have both options available. We have a uh, balancing with passive resistors, but we also have this what we call unbalanced, uh, which are which are matched electrically, and they have a very good performance, uh, as Renaissance basically uh, verified in their designs, and other customers uh, as well. So this is something we do differently uh, compared to others. One of the last slides, uh, I mentioned the Prisma cap is coming soon. This will be another flat design uh, from our portfolio. It will also be flexible. And uh, we are really, really looking forward to that. That would be all from me. So thank you for your attention and uh, to all the future team to make this event happen. And then I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you. Radek, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for completing our webinar presentation. Uh, actually, we've received many, many questions during uh, these presentations, but uh, being very conscious of uh, time now, I think it makes best sense that we follow up all questions that you've sent. So we'll be in touch with everyone uh, to react to their questions following this live event. Thank you for posing those questions to the team. Uh, as I highlighted at the start of this webinar, uh, everyone who has attended uh, will receive a follow-up pack of technical information and all of the resource material uh, that will uh, 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 showcase what has been shown during this live webinar. Um, please also check out www.futureelectronics.com where you can find plenty more information uh, and also upcoming events. Uh, it was really my pleasure to host this uh, live webinar uh, with the team. Uh, a big thank you to our three supplier experts. Uh, that's very much appreciated uh, for your contribution. Thank you. Uh, and we look very much forward to seeing you all at our next online event.